everybody. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. Cool. So welcome all and thank you so much for being here with us today. My name is Paola Valenzuela. I think I've met most of you, but I'm the event coordinator here at the Poetry Center. I'm uh, responsible for coordinating and facilitating the reading and lecture series and the classes and workshops. So I'm really, really excited to be here today um, hosting all of our students who participated in our classes and workshops um, during the 2021 and 2022 academic year. We really wanted to have this reading so that we could share and celebrate the work that you guys have all done as writers. Um, all of you guys here will be reading original work, some that was created um, as a response to the classes or um, poems that you created during our classes as well. So yeah, I'm really excited to be hearing all of your original work. Thank you so much for being here today and um, on to our first reader. Let's give a warm applause. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon, I guess it is. Uh, I'm Jay Lehman. I'll be reading The Shed on Hawthorne for Sue and Ron. Walking along a back road on an early winter's morning, the air still and see your breath cold. It is dark and will be windy later as it has been daily for weeks, odd for this time of year. The area rarely holds surprises. I pass the wooden shed I've seen often. For a shed, it is large, reminiscent in size of being on Walden, that spare cabin in the woods near a railroad track which disturbed that peace. The windows show the shed is filled to the roof with a detritus is, its owner is afraid to give away or lose. What scale is used to measure the parts of life worth saving? The shed may have three chairs, the bed, the desk, a pen, but stacks and stacks of boxes and clothing pressed against the glass render it decidedly unwalden, its owner decidedly unthorough, not a word, but necessary in our understanding. I think of my own three sheds, holding Coho's toys, Hobbes artwork, hubcaps from daddy's old Oldsmobile, these things made sacred by the touch of someone loved but long gone. Pope Francis has said, own nothing. Saint Francis, filled with empathy, freely gave away his last possession, a cloak. How do they do it? Moving forward, the sun rises, my eyes water, the wind from the east stirs a bit. I turn right onto Norton and head home. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Chris McGuire, and um, I'll be reading Casualties of the Colonizers and Meditation on Respiration, Spring 2020. Um, this was for Pam Ashuk's class. Casualties of the Colonizers. The newborn javelina shrieks, her muzzle pocked with crimson, the victim of a dog attack. Her umbilical cord still hangs like a dried vine. I watch from behind glass as Dr. Kramer and her vet tech dab and cleanse the wounds with hands as delicate and synchronized as a harpist's. Yesterday they rescued a coyote whose maggot bloated hind leg twisted backward. They euthanized her on the triage floor beside the crate they carried her up in. The blue ID tag read, caught in fence. I stared down at her swollen teats and wondered what became of her orphans. In bird ICU, I push pieces of chopped mice down the throat of a red-tailed hawk too stunned from a collision with a car to remember how to eat. His fierce golden eyes track my hand. Steel, pin, steel pins together his left leg bone. Soiled tail feathers jut at odd angles. Just don't die, I whisper. I'm 12 again. 
biting my lip in the back seat of my father's Chevy Impala as he aims the front tires at a pair of pigeons strolling in small circles in the roadway, pecking. My mother is a statue beside him, eyes locked straight ahead. My father grunts in satisfaction at the thump thump beneath us. My heart throbs in my throat and I pray, you're out of your misery now. Meditation on Respiration, Spring 2020. That spring, I lay prone in dry creek beds full of moonlight, watching stars breathe in and out with me, taking the night deep into my core. I listened to the chanting of tree frogs and made offerings of my exhalations to the cottonwoods and sycamores who oxygenate these spaces. That spring, it seemed as if the whole world was gasping for air. The woodsy friend who introduced me to this practice would be dead to me in a year, but not from COVID and not physically. Some deaths are more racking than the final one, a gut punch of burst exhalation, followed by a period of breathlessness. When I laid down in dry creek beds or meandered through forests or pad paddled my kayak through desert waters, I could forget about suffocation. I could forget about masks the sudden ubiquitous way they appeared on the scene, the way in the beginning it felt harder to breathe with them, the way their stark white or rainbow colors shuddered smiles or grimaces, the way I learned to draw people's eyes into myself, to feel out their expressions, to connect. By summer, I began to notice masks discarded on pavements smeared with tire tracks or washed up against river rocks like drowning Daytura. Masks hanging from the branches of acacia and mesquite like abandoned husks of crystallids or like Kevlar vests waiting for their owner's return. Thank you. Hi, I am Lori Gravely and I am I took the class with Carl Markham, Little Rooms Everywhere. It's an amazing class. I'm going to read a poem, not that I wrote for the class, but which seems more fitting for today. It's called Not All of My Children Have Been Born. This poem was written in response to um, a photograph of a place called Blood Falls, Antarctica. And at that time, I was visiting and looking for houses here in Tucson and driving up and down Speedway Boulevard. Finally... There's proof that Earth is woman. Blood pouring from a crevice at the bottom of the world, her white thighs open. I imagine the torment of contractions. I lost a child once that I didn't know I carried. I bled for a month, saturated pads every hour until they scraped the remnants and pumped me full of iron. I don't know why. I think of the girl I worked with whose husband cut off her head and placed it on a shelf in their trailer before he set it all on fire. How the blood must have run over the floors and into the soil beneath. Blood, fall, woman. I've been wondering about my other children too, the ones I didn't carry, wondering where they went when they left my body. Tucson's fetuses whisper to me from the anti-choice billboards. At 14 days, it can open its eyes. At a month, it finally has arms. My daughter-in-law carries photographs of her unborn child into the house, and they unfurl like a proclamation. Finally, she's hungry again. I feed her kale with tofu croutons. How have I gotten here from a photograph of blood for pouring from beneath the white ice thighs of earth? We have endured so much violence. No wonder the blood still runs. again. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be reading today for Victoria Francisco, who couldn't be here with us today. So she asked me if I could read this poem for her. And uh, she took uh, Kimberly Johnson's Word Horde in the Lure of the World, which is a really fun class. 
and this poem is called We'll Inherit This Someday. Steep staircase to a basement, I never pictured beige. Your old bedroom in this old house, in it, the chimney. You've told me you love it through hatred of your mom's paint job in the kitchen. We've gotten rid of most of the blues, some splats still living on the creases. But mistakes happen, like black carpets and powder green walls. Such a choice for a 10-year-old. I'll never be that supportive. And for all your clutter, you know, the scattered tools and memorabilia and lemon trees you won't get rid of. They'll grow some lemons some days, is what you say. You show such 50s optimism. Hey everybody. <laughs> Uh, my name's Nicole Casebeer, and I took um, Danica Kelly's Love Poetry and Boundaries class. And I'll be reading a couple, one that I started in the class and one that I wrote after. Um, Violated is the first one, and Black Hole, like hole with an H, is the second one. This is Violated. Violet lips, magenta thews. Juicy grip so tight it bruised through and through. It's true, she is. She's known. The story goes, written on the skin she shows, saying, look, your fruit's all over the place. You let yourself get juiced. You fucked up your own face. Violet lip, ripped open, taste. Desire like iron, hot blood runs to pools of pulsing quiet. She is. She's been known by hands that overpower places where forbidden fruits were once flowers. It's true, it's true that you, me, or she could all be a keeper of secrets and bruisey, blooming skin bound to wounds and beatings of hearts and kin, saying, look, within. I don't want to hide them. Truth forms in hues of blue, green, and violet, the color of veins, eyes, riots, and broken silence. She is, she asked for it, they say. Asked for what? Nothing but loving touch. And this is called Black Hole. Despite our relative's inheritances, relativity says there can be no hole in the universe or hole in me for that matter. Only a deep, deep fold. There can be no tear in the seam, just seemingly ripples of tears streaming like stars stippling the same dark face. A place wrapped in darkness becomes a black hole, a wound like songs and longing, a fainting, throbbing mass of emptiness and infinite belonging. Yes, relativity says that choosing isn't losing that which wasn't chosen but rolling with laughter because we are both held and holding a million light years folding hereafter. What does the universe hold in its vastness black? What do we embrace when the universe holds us back? Thank you. Hi, my name's Tim Schaffner, and I was in two workshops in the, uh, these last few months. And um, <clears throat> the first one was uh, a morning workshop with uh, the writer Luis Alberto Urea, and um, I was not aware of, as much about his poetry, but he had uh, done a reading here as well that was, and. Um, gave a little seminar, um, and this is called uh, 25,000 Haikus in a Row, which is how he described um, his novel, The Hummingbird's Daughter. Um, so this is kind of a uh, poetic portrait of Louis Alberto Urea. 
He is COVID masked like us, though his is black and bits of red and white whiskers sprout from the fringes. He dons a snow white gallabera adorned with hummingbirds, black jeans and black sneakers from which peak neon green prickly pear cactus embossed on black socks. He speaks to us of our three indwelling spirits, angel of creation, indestructible, the drill instructor, loving, cajoling, a friend who eggs you on to become better. Then there's Mr. Smith, for whom you're never good enough, your inner devil who says you're worthless, a figure, he tells us, inspired by that angry boss at the San Diego donut shop where he toiled as a teenager in pre-dawn hours. He reads us poems by Jim Harrison, Arthur Zay, Kay Ryan, and tells us how first he came to poetry, writing lyrics for a friend's rock band before he found Rilke. And he quotes his mentor, Ursula K. Le Guin. We as poets exist to remind people what it means to be alive. Open the door to randomness, he calls. Our hands are the universe. They can do anything. And then this one is from the translation workshop that was conducted by Kelsey Bonata um, of the um, ALTA, American Literary Translators Association, which is based here now. And um, this was kind of a, when kind of lost in translation theme where you're sort of in between languages. It's called Rain Song. We sing karaoke to La Bamba. Though I did not know the difference entre aniversario y cumpleaños. I said I eat poems in Spanish when I meant I read poems in Espanol in any language. Any language will do if it helps me to cry, llorar, and laugh, reír, like rain on the rooftops. Come, let's laugh and be like rain. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to all our readers. That was really beautiful. And I know it takes a lot of courage to get up here and read. So thank you so much. That's amazing work. And hopefully I'll see you perhaps in some of our classes in the upcoming uh, semesters. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.